So this is the 10th lecture, and in the previous nine, I've been uh, at some pains to um, document the incredible structure of, of human language, its um, semantic structure, its uh, syntactic structure. structure. Um, and the question, of course, arises, um, and uh, is it, and in particular, is it comparable to other cognitive systems that pre-existed? There are other cognitive systems uh, in, uh, in, in our total psyche. There's, um, if you divide them up very roughly, there would be things like perception in general, which would include the several modalities like visual perception and, uh, motor, uh, and uh, kinesthetic perception, auditory perception. There is, as another cognitive system, there's motor control. Uh, there is the affect system of emotions and so forth. And uh, there's the reasoning system. And each of these, the attentional system, each of these systems has a certain kind of uh, organizational uh, system and set of structuring features. And the one question that arises is the last two main cognitive systems to have evolved were language and culture, language and cultural structure, because I, I um, propose that there's a, a, a cognitive system devoted to cultural structure. So um, in, as they evolved, the, the question is, did they, were they able to ex exhaustively provide for their own organizational uh, makeup simply by borrowing bits and pieces from the other cognitive systems that were already in place, or did they have to, uh, did something new have to evolve? Uh, and my proposal, the general proposal here is that, in fact, language, when it uh, evolved, as it evolved in over who knows how long a period, uh, certainly hundreds of thousands of years, uh, perhaps over a million, um, it, uh, the proposal here is that it had to, in fact, to overcome a certain bottleneck, it had to have evolved a certain property, which I'm calling digitalization. Um, most of the other cognitive systems, in, in most of their functions, or in much of their function, um, are analog in character, sort of involving gradients, uh, iconic uh, aspects. And for language to uh, perform its function, uh, my proposal is that it had to evolve, either elaborate what was already in existence elsewhere but minimal, or evolve afresh uh, this new kind of digital system, which, uh, which I'll describe in a second. It, it at least involves discrete kinds of units. Um, so here was the evolutionary problem that might have uh, faced, uh, I'm speaking metaphorically, of course, none of this is... Um, I mean, evolution is not teleological, and there's no, but, but just to speak metaphorically, um, early hominids uh, might have faced a kind of bottleneck, if you think of it that way, of um, two opposing tendencies. One was hominids were presumably increasingly getting smarter, so they were having more and more uh, conceptual capacity in their cognition. Uh, and uh, the, the issue was, uh, as that happened, could the, the bottleneck was between increasing capacity for conceptual content, which would have included um, uh, a greater range of just qualitative conceptual content, uh, a greater range of um, granularity, whether it's a, a generic content or fine-grained content, uh, uh, it would a greater range of complexity, simple or intricate, and so forth. All of this might have started, been on the verge of evolving or uh, been in progress of evolving, uh, together with the um, communication of that, the interaction of that, uh, of such concepts within an individual hominid to its fellows. How much interaction could there be? Um, and you would necessarily, it, it would be on the verge of increasing um, thought capacity with uh, the need for also, uh, it, it would have been uh, selectively, it would have been selectively positive to be able to increase the capacity to communicate more of that more quickly with greater fidelity. 
The bottleneck was that um, the means for communication at that point it, in, with, in the auditory, uh, in the vocal auditory channel, this, this channel between mouth and ear, uh, was highly limited. It had, um, it had many constraints, limitations, which as they were constituted at that time in evolution were inadequate for um, uh, as, a, as a carrying capacity for this increasing or potentially increasing capacity of thought and its communication to uh, across uh, members of the species. And it, it was limited uh, for about four different reasons. One is it had um, what I'm calling low parallel parallelness. It had uh, relatively few independent parameters of variation that it could vary the, the auditory channel. Uh, I'll, I'll elaborate all this in a second. But um, it had very low iconicity, which all, both of which would have been advantageous. Uh, it had um, a, a relatively little degree of differentiation within within auditory. The auditory range is relatively limited, and the medium was was noisy. The medium through air was rather noisy. So what happened? And my suspicion is that the the resolution to this bottleneck, mind you, the bottleneck probably has existed at many places and many species at many times during evolution, and it may never have been resolved, but. It could be that the hominids were the first to have evolved the relevant mutations that wound up resolving this bottleneck. And what it was was that the carrying, the, the, um, the means for communication, the vocal auditory tract, became increasingly digital in character. So from having been primarily analog, meaning involving gradients and icon iconic kinds of things, to being increasingly digital. So here's what I mean by digital. Um, it, inc it, in it encompasses four steps. Um, first, instead of gradients, uh, it, it can have discrete units within it. So that's the first level, it has discrete units. Um, so discrete, uh, as opposed to a gradient analog kind of thing. Secondly, the discrete the units could be simply discrete steps along uh, uh, a, a dimension, or here's the next step of what I mean by digitalization. Uh, each discrete um, uh, unit could also have its own categorical distinct identity. It's this, this instead of just a dis discrete jumps along a single parameter, it could have, this is a distinct, qualitatively distinct category of thing, this is another distinct category of thing. So that's the second step in digitalness, digit, in, be, in being digital. The third one, and all of these appear in language. Um, I should say that the first two also appear in, in some, uh, both in other words, discreteness and qualitatively distinct categories for these distinct chunks, also appear in other cognitive systems, like in visual perception and in motor control, I suspect. So those two there are precursors for. So language could easily, as it evolved, have borrowed um, or tapped into those pre-existent forms of digitalness in other cognitive systems. There are two more steps, though, to what I call digitalization. The next is uh, recombination, is my term for it, on the, on the notion of recombinant DNA. It's that where you have several uh, if you have a, um, an inventory of certain set of discrete categories, do they, the, do they simply remain in their home sites where they originate, or can they recombine? In other words, enter into different arrangements uh, relative to each other, so enter into different patterns. So that's, the, that's what I call recombination. And... Uh, you were already starting to see less of this kind of phenomenon, recombination, in other cognitive systems. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm a, a novice when it comes to looking at other cognitive systems, but uh, a glance through them with my novice status suggests that there's relatively less 
recombination present in uh, other cognitive systems. The fourth step in what I call digitalization is where a, each of these arrangements, each, each of these distinct rearrangements of the, of the units, in, its, in turn, c constitutes a new higher level entity. It's what I call emergentness. Uh, so on the one hand, it could just remain just patterns, just different arrangements, or the different arrangements could, in turn, each arrangement could have its own new identity, con constitute its own identity. Uh, just, I mean, a, a quick, just to orient you quickly to what I'm referring to, the, the uh, commonest example of that is phonemes into morphemes. So you have, um, let's say, phonemes k, a, and t in English. Well, you can, re you can recombine them in different orders, like cat, tack, act. And furthermore, each of these different arrangements has a new higher level identity, identity as, a, as a novel morpheme, each with its own meaning. So each of these three combinations I just gave you it has its own meaning and is, is, is understood cognitively. It work, uh, it's experienced cognitively as discrete higher level units. So that's the basic idea. So there's four levels to, to what I'm calling digitalization. And um, it seems to me that, that uh, th the first two steps, uh, as language evolved, it could easily have borrowed from other cognitive systems. But the second two steps, it, they may exist. We'll s perhaps if we have time, see examples, uh, uh, putative examples in other cognitive systems. Uh, but if they're there, they're relatively minimal, I think. And so language either borrowed them already pre-existing and then greatly elaborated it, or it, uh, it evolved it afresh for the first time and, and also greatly elaborated it. Um, and in doing so, it, um, it happened for the first time in hominid evolution, and it resolved the bottleneck. It now permitted the, the means of communication, this vocal auditory ch channel, to have the carrying capacity to uh, express, to represent, um, all of these different, th this large number of distinct concepts, um, and, and do so with some fidelity in this noisy medium, by virtue of being digital, um, and to uh, do it quickly. So uh, that's the general layout of the thing. And the, um, the steps that I'll take in, uh, in analyzing this is first is to show uh, how uh, the vocal auditory channel is, in fact, very um, limited in its capacity. It has limited capacity. And I'll, I'll sh demonstrate that first by comparing it with uh, with, the, with another channel, the, the one used in sign language, the manual visual channel. Manual visual channel is another channel. Uh, each of these two channels has a production and a perception component. The vocal part of the vocal auditory channel is the production part. The auditory is the perception part. In, in sign language, you have the manual or more generally bodily, facial uh, uh, gesticulations. And the perception part of it is, uh, is visual. So I'm going to contrast the, uh, uh, the vocal uh, auditory channel with the manual visual channel. And we'll see that the manual visual channel has many more advantages, is much less limited, much less constrained than the vocal auditory channel. Um, if, for whatever reason, if it had been chosen, I mean, not chosen, if it had wound up being the channel used for um, uh, communication, which it wasn't, if it had been, uh, a number of uh, certain elements of this um, uh, bottleneck might have been resolved at the outset. There, there might not have been a bottleneck. But for whatever reasons, the vocal auditory channel was the one that got involved in further evolution of communication. And so it had a bottleneck. So the first thing I'm going to do is to c compare and contrast these two channels, these two modalities of communication, to show how limited the vocal auditory one uh, channel is. And um, the first uh, uh, pr uh, 
character, way in which it's limited is in terms of um, parallelness. Um, by this I mean uh, how many distinct independent parameters does the uh, modality have, does the channel have, each of which can vary independently. Um, and it turns out that the manual visual channel has a very large number. The vocal auditory channel has relatively few. And the, the advantage to having many uh, parallel parameters, each of which can independently and concurrently express some uh, channel of information, is that you can uh, communicate more information in the same unit of time if you've got more channels in parallel. It's a broad band as opposed to a narrow band. So you can uh, communicate more information in the same unit of time, or um, if you have a certain amount of communication, it'll take you less time to convey everything if you've got multiple channels to do it on. Um, so let's look at the number of distinct uh, parameters available in each channel. So let's first look at the uh, vocal auditory channel. I've, I count eight. Um, the, f the, the main one uh, is itself, uh, the main one that language in fact uses, is itself a digital system. It's a, it's a discrete system and it's digital. Um, uh, whether it evolved later or pre-existed among uh, animal communication systems, uh, I'm not sure. But in any case, it's the parameter of the distinction between pataka, badaga, mana, and all the different vowels and so forth. That I'm calling that phonetic quality. And it's a discrete system. So that's one parameter. It, there's seven more parameters which I, collectively I call vocal dynamics. And it is a gradient system. It includes things like loudness, you know, softer, louder, uh, rate of, sp or, uh, no, I'll do uh, pitch, how high, how low, um, tam, what's, let's see, rate, timbre. Timbre is the vocal quality, if you talk narrow nasal voice or if you talk like that, that kind of, this timbre thing. Uh, the thing that distinguishes um, in different in instruments from each other. Um, Several other features, like you know, in, dis, how enunciated the things are, or various other vocal qualities like nasality and so forth. And then there are two temporal ones: um, the rate that something is, uh, that things go faster or slower, or the duration of which anything is held, held shorter or longer. Um, okay, it, and I suspect that the this, this vocal dynamics set of parameters, these seven, I mean, seven is not you know, inscribed in stone, and maybe there's eight, maybe there's nine, I don't know, however you divide it. But in any case, it's a, um, uh, it's a, uh, a gradient system. It's an analog system. And I suspect it's uh, an, a more ancient system, um, which was already present in, in animal communication. Animals long, have long since had capacity to vary things in terms of uh, magnitude, like loudness or extent of gesture, um, speed and, and uh, pitch and all those kinds of things. They've, uh, so those have long been. I suspect that that analog system is more ancient and simply was carried over into modern day language as a, as a, a vocal dynamics system uh, side by side with the newly evolving phonetic quality system, which in its digital character, that's, that's my guess. Um, by, co by contrast, go look at the uh, number of parameters, separate individual, individually variable parameters. By the way, each of these parameters, these eight in, uh, in uh, spoken language, in, in language, um, can be varied independently. They're all totally independently variable. So they, they owe nothing to each other. Um, there's a list of some 30, by my count. Uh, this is like my analysis of it, and uh, I'm a novice in sign language analysis, but this is one count that I've made and others may well disagree, but anyway, this is one. Um, of uh, some 30 independently variable parameters that are present in the uh, sign language system, 
Specifically in, I mean, I, this is the part of the talk that I gave, I don't know which sixth talk or something, uh, or fifth talk, where I, I went in detail into contrasting the spoken language system for representing um, s the spatial domain and the sign language one. So in particular, all sign languages, there are many different sign languages, uh, including a Mandarin sign language, I mean, one spoken in, uh, one uh, signed in, in China, at least parts of China. Um, but I'll, I'll illustrate with the American Sign Language, ASL. Uh, all sign languages, it seems, have a specific, kind, a specific subsystem, which is generally called a classifier subsystem. Uh, poorly named, but that's what it's called. And it's independent of the, it's separate from the system of lexical signs, like this is the lexical sign for book, this is lexical sign for enter, uh, uh, and, uh, and, their, and their modulations, that's a, that's a separate kind of system. The classifier subsystem is totally devoted to representing objects moving with respect to each other in space. That's all it does. So I'll, I'll repeat the example that I gave uh, when I gave this talk. Um, the one hand, the right hand, the dominant hand, in my case the right hand, represents the object that's moving or located, the figure. So it could be like a ground vehicle or uh, an uh, aeronautic vehicle or an animal or a person moving along. Uh, could be any of these. And uh, the, the other hand is the ground object, the, ob the reference object with, with respect to which the figure moves. So this could be a tree. And so this is, could be a car drove past the tree. But in addition, you can vary many aspects of it. So, uh, and these are all independent parameters which can be represented concurrently with each other and each varied separately. So this first is the, the, the path, then uh, relative to the ground, it could be past, then it could be up a hill, drove past the tree up a hill, could be up a curved hill, could be up, bump, up a bumpy curved hill, could be fast, could be the hill, the road could pass close to the tree or far from the tree, this way or this way. Let's say it's close to the tree, it could, it could start further away or it could start close to the arm and end further away. So all of these things are possible and you're concurrently layering one kind of dimension, one kind of parameter on top of another. So each of these that I just mentioned is is listed separately as one of these 30 of, on the list. So, uh, so uh, we'll, I'll skip through the 30 and then we'll go right past it. And then, um, um, so in addition to simply having more available independent parameters in any given channel, you also have to use them. I mean, they might be available, but do you use them? Well, it turns out that, um, using sign language, uh, modern-day sign language, uh, yes, every one of these 30 that I have on the list is, is used a lot in, independently. Uh, and uh, whereas, so if you can say that, if there's a category of parameter range, you can say that sign language has parameter spread. It has lots of, it uh, uses all of its different parameters. Uh, spoken language, uh, or yeah, spoken language for its part, with its eight, even though it has eight, it has relatively few, but it, it doesn't use all of them very much uh, to convey most of its, its uh, conceptual content. It mainly relies on the first one, the phonetic quality one, uh, in which, by the way, I would include tones uh, in Chinese under, the, under number one, um, <coughs> rather than pitch. So. Um, it, it, it has what I would call parameter concentration. Even though it has a few parameters at least, it mainly it uses parameter number one more, more than all the other parameters together to convey uh, conceptual content. So it has parameter uh, uh, concentration. And, um, uh, and the the interesting thing is that uh, within, with parameter spread, 
One thing that uh, sign languages do is, in this particular classifier subsystem, is it uses different kinds of movement to represent different kinds of conceptual content. Uh, true, the conceptual content all pertains to objects moving relative to each other in space, but still that has um, different aspects to it, and a number of different aspects are separately and separately represented by different ones of the parameters. So for example, um, the kind of object moving is represented by the hand shape. Is it a, a car or a plane? Um, the distance between the figure and the ground is represented by the distance between the figure and the ground. The, um, the speed at which it's moving is represented by the speed at which it's moving. Uh, the, um, uh, the angle of the, uh, of the path is represented by the angle of the path, straight. So, and so you've got, uh, I mean, first of all, that's iconic, but that's not the point here. The point here is that you've got a subdivision of qualitatively different kinds of information, conceptual content, um, represented severally by distinct different kinds of motions. Of, of, uh, so so they're, they're categorized into different slots, into different cubby holes. Whereas spoken language is radically different from this. All of this kind of, this whole range of conceptual content with all its different kinds is all channeled down into one parameter, phonetic quality. Uh, as, I mean, all the different phonemes and as they are grouped together into morphemes and then into sentences. I mean, but, I mean, true, you, you have all that, but it's all funneled together into just one uh, type of parameter. Uh, uh, so all these distinctions as to uh, speed rate, I mean, for example, if, 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 uh, if I try to say this in English, if I try to say something like the car sped bumpily uh, up past the tree on a on a curved road or something like that, you know, so I'm trying to find the closest English equivalent to, to this business. <clears throat> um, it's all done with one parameter, uh, phonetic quality. It's not subdivided, the different types of information are not subdivided uh, into separate different kinds of motions. So, so there is there's an example of parameter concentration for you. And presumably the logic of it, why this happened, is that um, as it evolved, spoken language, um, uh, in order to overcome its, this bottleneck, had to rely on digitalization. Uh, to, uh, and, it, and it did so in a big way. It picked one parameter, went digital with it, and it, it put all its eggs in this one basket. Um, okay, the second... Um, uh, comparison uh, between spoken and sign language is, I mean, all this is by way of showing the, the limitations of the vocal auditory channel. It, just to, it'll be, it'll prove relevant in a, a bit later, but for now, just to be complete in this, let's look over uh, what's needed, what, what's available in a channel. Any channel is necessarily both a production and a perception channel. So, for anything to serve as an available parameter in it, it has to be good for both element, for both components of the, of the channel. Well, there are some things in each of these channels that are, are unavailable precisely because they only exist in one of the components. So for example, um, in uh, the manual visual channel, um, some relevant um, uh, uh, distinctions are available uh, visually to the, to the perceptual part, such as texture of something or color, but are not readily uh, representable by uh, manual representations. There's a bit of texture stuff in ASL, like this is uh, dotted stuff, or, but it's relatively um, 
it's relatively minimal. Uh, and, uh, and you certainly can't represent color manually in this, in this same system. I mean, you can do it as a lexical sign, but not, as, not in this uh, classifier system. Uh, and then the other, the other way around, there are some things uh, available manually which aren't available, uh, can't be perceived, namely pressure, degree of pressure. How, and interestingly, you know, there is a, a language for the people who are both blind and deaf, uh, which is manual, manual, and they, that can use, that, that one does have available to a degree of pressure. <clears throat> But uh, standard, the standard manual visual modality does not. And so those, those three kinds of uh, characteristics, qu uh, qualities, conceptual types, uh, are not uh, included in that, in that channel. Um, comparably, in, in the uh, vocal auditory channel, um, some things are available to audition to hearing, which is not available to speech. And the main one, which is going to be important, is that you can hear um, the location of an object, a bird tweeting over there, or uh, something, a uh, bird flying through the air along a certain path, you can hear it. You can hear s locations, sites, and path paths. Um, but you yeah, can't produce it vocally. Um, you can't, I mean, with dummies, uh, can throw their voice. That's the term in English, to throw your voice, but it's not true. You can't do it. If you could, you could make your voice sound like it's coming from over there or sound like it's moving, but it can't be done. And um, if it could, then language would have a nice available parameter for representing paths and sites in space, but it doesn't. Um, and similarly, there are uh, aspects of things that can be done vocally that you can't hear, like you can move, make all sorts of motions inside your mouth, but if you don't breathe them out, you can't hear it. So, okay, so that's kind of uh, fleshes out the, um, the, this particular range. Okay, let's switch to the next one, which is iconicity. And again, the upshot is going to be that um, the manual visual uh, channel is highly highly or can be highly iconic, whereas the vocal auditory channel is highly uniconic or, or in terms of relevant iconicity. The reason for um, going at some length into this, uh, what sign, la sign language can do, is it's, it's an existence proof. Um, it shows that we have the cognitive capacity to, um, to represent to, and to convey concepts through a system which is massively parallel and massively iconic, um, it could have been the system uh, used. Uh, it could have been the, the channel uh, that wound up being the main communicati communicative channel. It wasn't, but it, it, has, a, it has a kind of a existence proof uh, demonstration for its iconic, for its cognitive feasibility. So that's one of the main reasons for going through this. Um, so, and now the advantage to iconicity is uh, that if you've, if you've got a communication system which is iconic, it directly, it can directly represent the concept that it's standing for. It, it, its own, its very own nature, its own form, will automatically represent the content. And that's an advantage, because without that, you have to independently develop symbols. You have to have a whole new cognitive kind of phenomenon, which is symbols, which is where um, one kind of thing represents another kind of thing, or one kind of form represents a concept that, it, that it's unrelated to, that has no no, no commonality across them. And uh, that might be cognitively costly. It might, uh, and it means that you have to have, if it's an extensive system of communication, it means you've got to have a whole additional cognitive system for um, a set of symbols uh, of unrelated things, correlating unrelated things, and a whole set of processes for encoding and decoding. 
You have to encode the idea into a set of unrelated symbols, and the hearer has to decode them into the, to, back into the concepts. So all of this could be cognitively costly, so that's why it's a, it presumably is uh, an advantage to have as much iconicity as possible. Well, uh, spoken language doesn't have it, and that's another, this whole section of the talk is to demonstrate the limitations on the vocal auditory system, which is why it wasn't as it was constituted uh, back in the early hominid days, was it was inadequate to the task at hand. That's why there was a bottleneck. So let's go through some of the, um, yeah, to, to, to demonstrate this, let me first um, describe what I think iconicity uh, entails. And it's because uh, there really hasn't been a good analysis of iconicity. So it calls for some kind of um, closer analysis. And here, here is one. First of all, I, I would distinguish it between minimal iconicity and a strong iconicity with additional correl correlating elements or features. Minimal iconicity is when you've got um, uh, two things, which I'll call a form and an entity, um, where one aspect of the form represents some aspect of the entity, uh, and that aspect is identical across the two. So, so um, you've got iconicity if you've got some aspect of the form that's identical to some aspect of an, of an entity, and it represents it. And then you can say that aspect is iconic of that aspect that aspect of the form is iconic of that aspect of the entity. So an example, the English word way uh, can refer to um, at a great distance. So if I say it's way over there, it means it's over there at, at a great distance between me and it. Okay? But now, uh, spoken language does have just a bit of iconicity. In this case, it has, you could say it's way over there. Extend the volley, it's way over there. Then. What you've got now is an aspect of the form. The aspect of the form is uh, uh, increased vowel duration. And that represents increased extra distance. Uh, so if it's way over there, then it's further than it was if you just said it's way over there. So we've got iconicity. The iconicity is that um, there is a particular dimension, namely um, increased uh, quantity along some parameter. And in this case, it's along the parameter of vowel duration. So it's increased there. And it's incre here, uh, in terms of the, the referent, it's increased distance of separation uh, in space. And this, furthermore, this increased uh, duration represents that increased uh, separation. So it's iconic of it. OK, that's minimal iconicity. In addition, you want uh, covariation. And to, you have a, a part of strong iconicity. The first part is if you've got uh, covariation. So it's, it's a, that's an addition to it. So for example, covariation means um, if you've got several different versions of this, aspect, of this aspect and several other different versions in the entity, and they correlate. I'm calling it covariation. So for example, if I say it's way over there, uh, that this length correlates with that. This duration correlates with that length. If I say it's way over there, that extra vowel duration correlates with that extra increased length, much, much longer. Um, another one is that they are, um, uh, what's the term I use? Proportional. So it could have been that simply there are several different vari versions of this, of this um, aspect, just different lengths. It could be that short length corresponds, sh the shorter one of the extra lengths corresponds with the longest one of the, of the spatial length. And the, you know, they wouldn't have had to correspond. But if they, if they correspond in, in line, shorter, medium, and the, of the extra vowel durations, way, 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 forming a, a line, in, uh, then they are proportional to each other if that is, in fact, um, uh, iconic with, in agreement with the sh sh shorter extra length, middle extra length, longest extra length, then fine, you've got, they're also in agreement in terms of proportionality. And if they do it uh, in step, instead of reverse, that, then they are in fact directly proportional. That's the third one, so they have proportional directness. 
as opposed to it could be that the longer you, you say the vowel, the shorter the extra length is. But no, it's the longer the vowel is, the longer the vowel duration, the longer the extra distance. So they're, they're covariant, coproportional, and uh, co-direct in their proportionality. Uh, in addition, you can have co-granula, uh, co-granularity. So, I mean, you have the issue of co- uh, if they're co-granular. So that means if they're, by granularity, I mean if something is either uh, continuous or discrete. Well, in this case, they are also co-granular. The vowel duration can be increased in, in length continuously, and that corresponds approximately with a continuous increase in extra length of, the, of separation, extra, extra distance. Um, there are other cases in English, so, so they are co-granular, uh, uh, and in particular, they are co-gradient. Um, there are other cases where there's a, a discon- uh, they're not the same form of granularity. So you can say the bird flew up, up, and away, or the bird flew up, 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 and away, or the bird flew up, 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 and away. Uh, actually, Superman did that. So um, that's the phrase from Superman's comic books. <laughs> uh, so, well, here we've got um, the the uh, on the language side, the form side. It is discrete. How many ups have you said? So it's discrete, but it's it's referring to a a gradient degree of distance. Uh, so, uh, so you've got a disconnect. So these two forms are not uh, iconic as, with respect to this parameter of granularity, whereas the, the, uh, the way one is. Finally, they can be co-dimensional. As it turns out, that's the final, f- uh, if you've got all of these, then you have the strongest form degree of iconicity. Um, if you've got, uh, as it turns out, the example with it's way over there it lacks this codimensionality. That's because way exists in the dimension or the domain of vowel duration, duration in, in time, whereas the, the entity that it's referring to refers to the domain of distance in space. So they are not codimensional. They lack that iconicity. But maybe if you had an example, if you use the word loud, if you could in English, use, I don't know if you can, but if you could use the word loud, just the word loud, and say it louder and louder to refer to how loud something was, he spoke loud, he spoke loud, like that, then you are all of these um, things plus being codimensional because the very loudness that you're using is in the same co- uh, uh, dimension or domain as what, as what it's referring to. So that's the strong, that, if that exists, it probably does, um, that's the strongest degree of iconicity you can have. Okay, so that's by way of uh, defining, characterizing iconicity. Okay, so now let's look at the, um, so it turns out that um, spoken language has an enormous amount of, uh, of iconicity and it's often of the strongest type. So, um, so for example, uh, almost of those 30 parameters I gave you for um, s- signed language, all but the first two are really iconic, and many of them have the strongest form. So, for example, if I indicate that something is uh, moving in, in this classificatory system, if I indicate that something is moving up like that, it's strongly iconic in all, in all six ways. So it's, uh, if, uh, it means that it's moving up, it uh, indicates that, it's, it, that the object, if my hand moves up, it indicates that the object I'm referring to has moved up. It doesn't mean that it moved down. It doesn't mean that it moved in a circle. It doesn't mean that it got brighter. Uh, it means, so it means all, all the same things. Furthermore, it's even in the same dimension because it's in fact the, both the form and the referent are in space. They share a domain. So it's, it has the strongest form of iconicity. Um, furthermore, it's uh, all the different 30 parameters are relevant. It turns out that relevance is, is important in this realm of iconicity. Uh, some aspect, something could be iconic, but of low, low communicative relevance. So uh, it turns out that spatial aspects of 
objects are of high degree of relevance in communication. Um, people are often talking about objects located and moving through space. So it's high degree of relevance by contrast with, let's say, the temperature of objects. People seldom talk about the temperature of objects. So of all the properties of things that are around, the locations and paths of objects is relevant to communication. Their temperatures is not, or is, is low. Why that should be is itself another question. It's a separate question, uh, which it can be uh, investigated separately. It's not, not part of this investigation. OK, so uh, it turns out that all these 30 things that I just showed uh, for sign language are, in fact, relevant. Uh, uh, other things that are, might be relevant to communication in sign language, such as degree of pressure, color, and texture cannot be readily represented in this classifier subsystem. Uh, so that's, it's, that's a, by contrast, is a case of things that are relevant for communication, more or less, I presume they're relevant, but are not readily rep uh, represented. Uh, by contrast, uh, no, so by contrast, yeah. Let's, let's switch to, um, to uh, spoken language. Um, it has extremely little iconicity. First of all, it has several degrees of iconicity, several forms of iconicity, which it does have, but just simply aren't of much relevance to communication. For example, timbre, one of the parameters of, uh, of, of language, of spoken language, is iconic. In fact, it's strongly iconic. Uh, if, for example, I uh, changed my voice in a way that, that sounded like some other person, some other person's timbre, or way of talking, if I imitated George Bush, let's say. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but it's seldom relevant in communication. I mean, I guess it could have been, but it um, it's not, doesn't come up much. Uh, so here's a form of available iconicity, which is not relevant. Uh, secondly, and here's the part which it's kind of curious to me. Uh, there are kinds of... Um, uh, uh, Iconicity. There are forms of iconicity which uh, spoken language does have and which are extremely relevant, but curiously don't get used uh, in the language system. I don't know why, but I can, I can show how they might have been used if they were used. For example, they pertain to rate to the temporal um, uh, parameters, rate and duration. It could be that you could have used uh, rate, often you want to talk about how fast things move. It could have been that you could speak faster for something that moves faster and speak slower for something that moves slower in an iconic way. So for example, if I, I could, language could have been arranged in such a way that I could have said, the pen lay on the table, roll to the edge, and fall off. <laughs> but it, doesn't exist. Uh, similarly, you could have uh, had uh, a, an iconic system of duration, where you would uh, how long you took to say something or didn't say something. The pauses between could have been iconic with um, the duration of the thing you're referring to. So, for example, you could have said, um, "I came in the room, sat down, and fell asleep." Okay, so uh, you could have had uh, durational uh, extents built into language, uh, which were used, uh, iconic with the thing that they're representing, but that never worked its way into the system. Uh, again, why, uh, I don't know. Possibly because language uh, became so, uh, uh, put all its eggs into the one basket of um, of uh, phonetic quality that it just uh, ignored the other uh, parameters which were available to it uh, for use in conveying additional dimensions of c conceptual content. Um, finally, uh, language doesn't have available to it, spoken language doesn't have available to it, all sorts of uh, uh, aspects which, uh, which are iconic at all. In particular, the main thing it lacks is any means of representing objects moving through space. 
precisely because, I, as I indicated, you can't throw your voice and speak in a way that indicates where the objects are, um, then that whole, as you can in sign language, you can just indicate where something is, you can't do it vocally. You could hear it, but you can't pr produce it vocally. So uh, it, spoken language, that channel is simply missing out on one of the great relevant um, parameters uh, for, that, that's for, for communication, for things that people want to talk about. Uh, so by these means, we can, by this analysis, you can see that as a channel, uh, the vocal auditory channel really is rather low in its, um, in its avail available relevant iconicity. And so therefore, that's another, that was another part of its uh, uh, constraint, limitation, that, that provided the bottleneck. Okay, so all of this has been by way of showing uh, how the vocal auditory channel was highly limited. It created the bottle of the bottleneck. It, it's, it what, uh, it's what, uh, in, the, in that metaphor, um, uh, prevented uh, speedy, uh, subtle communication of, uh, of different concepts. Um, and, uh, and it didn't change in terms of evolution. It had to stay the same. There's no way to overcome these limitations within spoken language, within that channel. So, but it, to get around it as a means of getting around that limitation, uh, it developed this other thing, which I'm going to talk about next, namely digitalization or digitalness. It developed digitalness uh, as a means to compensate for this, these limitations which it couldn't overcome by the nature of the, of the entity. It couldn't overcome them. Uh, this whole last section has also been by way of showing, to, to bring into relief what these um, limitations were, by showing another channel that we, in fact, as humans, have available and, in fact, use uh, in, the, in the deaf community uh, uh, that would have been viable. It's cognitively feasible but for whatever, for whatever reason didn't get uh, uh, so, uh, hit on as the channel for uh, evolving further communicative uh, uh, capacity. Okay, so the next whole section is to document how digital language in fact the, is. The uh, way this has worked out is it's to show that spoken language, or just I'll just say language now, um, as a vocal auditory channel, has in fact developed an enormous amount of digitalness, um, uh, eight, perhaps as many as eight different forms of it, um, each with its own specific characteristics. Um, uh, many of them, uh, in fact, all, all of them are, dis on the, in the terms of the four-way distinction, all of them are at least discrete, uh, all of them are at least uh, categorial. All of them are recombinant, different arrangements. All these, the ones that I'm going to indicate to you now, have all those properties. Some of them also, about th three or four of them, are emergent, have, uh, have an additional higher level kind of uh, identity of, of object. Um, and Possibly, uh, language may have more than any other cognitive system, uh, and for that matter, it may have. It may have it, and other cognitive systems may not. That depends on what is the case about other cognitive systems. Um, so, and, and that uh, presumably, uh, if if we look at two points, we we can't track the evolution of it because you know there's the intervening steps are are not are non-existent i mean those those critters haven't survived but um uh if you we can look at present day language and so we as linguists can uh identify the 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 ways in which language is digital we can project back to a time uh retroject i guess back to a time when um you can imagine that 
uh, whatever vocal auditory system there was was not digital in this way, and therefore presume that it has to have evolved in the course of evolution, and then you can speculate on possible sequences for it and uh, how it, you know, which element came in, which stages came in when, and so forth. Okay, so this first uh, section on this five really recapitulates what I said at the outset. I mean, so I, I won't go through it again. I guess 5.1 does that. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So I won't go through it again. It's the four um, uh, things that I consider to be part of digitalness. Uh, I go into some greater detail into what I mean by recombination. I, I ex develop it uh, more explicitly. It's the notion that there is um, some, in, in each of these cases, wherever we've, in each of these eight cases where we've got digitalness in language, um, We've got a, um, an inventory of, of discrete, unitized, uh, qualitatively, categorially distinct elements. Um, and their recombination takes place by, from this inventory, selecting uh, a subset of them, so taking some number of them, putting them in some arrangement, and that arrangement uh, is, has certain properties, certain characteristics that are unique to that uh, form of digitalness. It, it, it arranges it in certain ways. For example, it can arrange in terms of temporal concurrence. It can, it can arrange sequentially uh, in uh, adjacency to each other, contiguity, um, different forms of arrangement. And, there, and each one will have different... Uh, uh, constraints on what govern the possible arrangements, the patterns of arrangement. Each one of them has different constraints. And, um, and, and so in other words, uh, of these eight, uh, it turns out that language has been so, so um, efflorescent in its, uh, so exuberant in its evolution of uh, digitalness that it, in fact, in some, maybe you could say it evolved eight different kinds of digitalness, each with its own patterns of arrangement and constraints on them. So uh, let's go over some of them. I mean, much of this is familiar to linguists. Uh, it's, it's of greater news to cognitive scientists who aren't linguists, who, who may not know this about language, whereas what I'm going to go through now is largely the, the material studied by linguists, so I, I won't dwell on it because I guess we're mostly linguists here, so... There are some things which are analog, analog in, uh, oh, and I'm going to divide this into the formal portion of language and the semantic portion. So first the formal aspect of language. There are things in, in language which are uh, analog, as, as we saw. So the vocal dynamics are analog. So the, to go next, um, the next thing is, uh, yeah, so things that are, things that are, uh, so now, aspects which are in fact recombinant, and some of them will be emergent. So phonetic features uh, recombine in different ways to form p distinct phonemes in any given language. So in any given language, there's an inventory of phonetic features. And for any given phoneme in that language, some subset of those features are selected and combined to form the phoneme. And the phoneme, it's, it's not only an arrangement, but the phoneme has a new higher level identity uh, which is unrelated to its features. So it's, um, uh, it's an emergent uh, uh, unit as well. So it's, it's got the highest form of digitalness. Uh, uh, and the, the kind of arrangement is concurrence. So the various phonetic features uh, co-occur co with each other. And the constraint on them seems to be simply whether they're compatible with each other. If you can pronounce them, move your mouth in a way that makes them feasible for pronunciation. Um, OK, I'll, that's enough for that. The next uh, example is um, uh, phonemes into morphemes. And again, we've got an, uh, an inventory of, in any given language, of phonemes. Um, and for any given, uh, in any given case, you select some number, put them in a particular arrangement, and they again constitute a new higher level entity, the uh, a morpheme, as I, as I showed with act, t, t uh, and k, 
get act and tack and cat, um, different arrangements, different morphemes, so it's a new emergent. And the, um, the conditions, uh, the, the type of arrangement are typically um, contiguous, one after, sequentially after another, although that's not necessarily so. For example, uh, in Semitic languages, you often have a triconsonantal root, uh, which don't have to be contiguous. Vowels can enter in between and so forth. So that's, an, that's a uh, counterexample. And the tones in Chinese are another counterexample. They, they cover the entire set of segmental phonemes. But uh, apart from that, for the most part, the kind of arrangements of the phonemes are sequential and contiguous. And the, um, the, the constraint on their arrangement has a name in linguistics. It's called phonotactics. They, those are the rules in any given language uh, that govern which uh, sequences of, of phonemes are permitted. So like in English, you, you can't say, you can say stick, but you can't say stick. I mean, it's not allowed as a possible combination. So, um, okay, so uh, other demonstrations of the dis dis distinction between uh, the phoneme level and the morpheme level to prove, to demonstrate it's, um, that it's a higher level emergent, I just gave one the act and attack thing. Another one is uh, a lot of morphemes, let's say, share a, the same sound as initial letter, like cat and cold and cut and, and could, but uh, there's no apparent uh, commonality of meaning that runs through those. So uh, that's another demonstration of their uh, working at two different levels. Or you might take, uh, uh, assume that, you, you might, if there were a closer relation, it might be that, um, if there were a conceptually you know, a, a continuum, like the colors of a rainbow, so like red, orange, yellow, they form a kind of continuum in a sequence. Well, you might have expected that the phonemic or, or representation of them might also rep uh, fall in a sequence. So you might have red, reg, reg to, to move your way down your mouth. Uh, but no, it doesn't happen. And similarly, you might have thought that in the, going the other way around, if you had rib, referring to a kind of bone, well, you might have thought that if you went to rid, it would be a you know, collarbone and, uh, and ridge would be you know, uh, backbone and rig would be whatever. But, uh, but no, you don't have um, uh, continuities. So they're, they're really two autonomous systems, um, and that's why you want to call the, the morpheme an emergent. I mean, the only... Um, uh, there is a kind of uh, break of that that's called you know, sound symbolism or onomatopoeia, but that's another, part of another discussion. Okay, the uh, third one is uh, morphemes into idioms. And uh, I think most analysts wouldn't have included that, but I, I will. Um, it's where you have separate morphemes, each with its own use as a morpheme, but you put them together, you get an idiom, which, has, which is a higher level unit because <clears throat> it has a new identity in its own right, a new meaning in its own right. It can't be predicted from, the, uh, from its components. That, that's what an idiom means. Uh, otherwise, it's um, compositional. So, uh, and, uh, and here's why it's important, by the way. I discovered, uh, I gave this talk at... Uh, a conference on language evolution, and uh, there were a number of uh, primatologists there. In fact, I talked to one whose name I forget, but if I ever write this down, I'll, I'll certainly cite her. She worked with um, a, um, a kind of uh, monkey called a putty-nosed monkey, and which made two kinds of sounds. Let's see if I remember them. Oh, God. She, uh, I'll just make up two sounds, but... Uh, uh, she, she gave them to me, but I don't have them. It, but I'll just make up two things. Something like, um, uh, I'll just say honk and putt. Okay, so uh, they make two kinds of sounds. And if they go honk, 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 it means something like, um, uh, uh, I'm kind of anxious, little anxiety, something might be uh, uh, going on out there. And put, it's kind of like fear, you know, get out of the place. 
And, uh, but if you, and you can go honk, 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 put, 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 put. But if you go, suddenly go, put, put, honk, put, put, honk, put, some kind of, you get an idiom. All of a sudden it means a new thing. And it means, uh, let's move to the next tree. So, uh, so anyway, so idioms are an ancient phenomenon uh, in, uh, in primates. So I wish I could have represented this correctly, but anyway, I, anyway, I did it schematically. Um, so, uh, so an example of, an, of idioms in English are uh, first, uh, you can, uh, you could, you have, just to put two whole phrases together, uh, to have it in for, so uh, he has it in for me, means um, have a grudge against and in plan revenge against the other person to, uh, to repay the grudge. That's what have it in for means. And there's another idiom, have it out with, which has nothing to do with the first one. It means um, if you have two people who've had a growing kind of um, disagreement between them, uh, and, they, and if you have it out with each other, if one has it out with the other, then um, you finally air the, uh, uh, the grievances and, and try and uh, uh, work towards a, a, an expression, an open expression of, what's, of what the problem is. Okay, so uh, each idiom is com composed of distinct elements, some of them same ones, it seems, uh, but... Um, uh, together, they, they give you a whole new meaning. And English, in fact, has a whole system of idioms uh, built up out of a verb and a satellite, or a verb and a satellite plus preposition. So, um, for example, take the verb to turn. Um, well, turn uh, up means for something to get found, like my cufflink turned, finally turned up, I'd lost it, finally turned up at the bottom of the hamper. I mean... Um, that means it became found. Turn down is to reject. I turned down the proposal. Turn in it means to go to sleep. I turned in for the night. No relation between any of these turning or in or any of these things. Um, any relation that you might see is fanciful. I mean, you might uh, in, introject into it some kind of metaphoric sense, but it's, um, it's, it's not necessarily there turn out, um, for something to eventuate in a certain way, he turned out to be right all along, uh, it means after uh, some period, this is how, this is the way it, uh, it, it uh, the, the, the actuality was. Turn on, she turned him on to Rilke, means she roused his interest in, Rilke is a German poet. Uh, turn over, means to, uh, like somebody turned the uh, stolen property over to the police. To turn over is to, um, give to the authorities, something like that. Okay, so that's, um, th these are active systems in, in, as far as I can tell, every language. Uh, and uh, in fact, I suspect it's one of the main, reason, main systems be is because uh, without it, you'd have to have a vastly greater um, set of distinct morphemes. And apparently there's some constraint on the number of distinct morphemes you can, you can re remember with their sounds. It seems apparently easier to store combinations of these morphemes, each with its own new distinct meaning. So anyway, that's, that's a, a third type. And um, a fourth type is, so that's also recombinant, it's also uh, emergent because each, uh, because um, each uh, idiom is, is an emergent new property. The fourth one level of this is just syntax. It's, uh, or within a, oh, I forgot to mention that all of these take place within a single word or across a sentence. So you have idioms within words, too. For example, uh, uh, considerable. Well, it's from consider and obel. Um, it could be literal. It could mean able to be considered. But it's also an idiom. It means rather, rather great. As a, as a, so it's, you can have an idiom within a complex word made up, made up of several morphemes. Okay, so um, within uh, then the fourth level is you can have morphemes or idioms or words. Uh, morphemes or words, whether they're idiomatic or not, 
uh, incorporated into whole expressions. And this again is totally recombinant. Uh, it, the, the, uh, again, you have a, uh, an inventory, the, the, great, the, extended, the extended lexicon consisting of the morphemes and the idioms within it. And then you combine them in various patterns, and the, the com combination is pretty much uh, contiguous, sequential. Uh, and the constraint on it is what's called syntax, um, which you can spend your life on. But that's the, um, but in terms of, you know, in other words, in a way, uh, Chomsky and linguistics fits in, 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 that, in that corner in terms of this perspective. I mean, that's where, that's where um, syntax fits in, in, in terms of this, this particular kind of analysis. Um, okay, so that's the formal property. And then uh, semantically, um, uh, you have similar kinds of things uh, in terms of um, elements of meaning. Um, so, oh, and I'm saying that, I'm sorry, just to go back for a second, I'm saying that syntax is not an emergent thing because um, it's the meaning of the whole expression is uh, pretty much derivable from the meanings of its components in their particular interrelations. Um, so if you've got the interrelations, the, the constructions that they're part of, and the meanings of the morphemes, as well as, as long as you include the idiomatic elements within there, then you can pretty well derive the meaning, uh, the, uh, derive the, the, the whole sentence. It's not, it's not, it's not a, new, a higher... Uh, entity, it's not a distinct new identity. It's compositional. Okay, now to the, um, the semantic level. Well, you've got, first of all, uh, the semantic components that make up, uh, that go into the overall meaning of any single morpheme or idiom. So, um, I, uh, again, you've got, uh, uh, what is the nature of the inventory? Well, I, part of my earlier work uh, that I spoke about earlier is uh, there are two kinds of forms in languages. There are open class forms and closed class forms. The closed class forms, which are you know, grammatical type forms like um, prepositions and conjunctions and, and inflections, they, is my, this is my proposal, they are composed of semantic elements which come from a relatively closed inventory of possible grammatically usable concepts. It's a relatively closed inventory. It's universally available. All languages draw from it, but you don't use any concepts outside it. So it's relatively closed. So in that respect, the inventory that you draw from is relatively closed, and any given closed class form uh, in any given language draws from that particular set of elements. And again, it, it, it it takes from them, and its mode of combination is concurrent. The very semantic components are realized in the same instant as you hear the morpheme. And the constraint, the, the, the kind of pattern of arrangement that they go into is into a schema. So, um, and, and various linguists, uh, including me and, and anybody who works on s schemas, um, has been at some pains in um, characterizing how the different components, fundamental semantic components, relate to each other in these schemas, uh, the, the particular patterns of arrangement and so forth. So uh, I give one example of that. Uh, the the uh, preposition past in English, as in the ball sailed past my head at exactly 3 o'clock. Well, I, I gave that example earlier. I, I'm not going to go through it now, but you can... What I do provide in this handout is a repeat of what I did before, which is uh, the numerous uh, semantic components that go into the simple one morpheme past in their particular arrangement. Um, for example, I'm just to give you a quick example, if you say the ball sailed past my head, it means it passed through a point to one side of the side of my head. If it didn't go through that, past that point, but went here, you said the ball sailed into my head. Uh, if it weren't 
horizontal but were vertical, you'd say the ball sailed down alongside me. If it were here in front of my head instead of the side, you'd say the ball sailed in front of my head. If it were here, you'd say the ball sailed over my head. So uh, past has, to say it at all, you have to, um, its meaning consists of a certain set of fundamentally identifiable uh, components in a particular schematic arrangement. Uh, okay, well that's the semantic part, and by gum, uh, language evolved that too. I don't know if that exists in other cognitive systems, but it certainly exists in language. Um, and, um, and just finally, uh, the semantic, uh, the, the, the meanings of individual morphemes and of idioms then combine together into the meanings, whole meanings of sentences and of, of discourse in general in a kind of compositional way. Um, it's an issue whether or not any given lexical item is an emergent or not. Whether, because there, and I give two arguments, pro and con. On the one hand, you could say, well, yeah. Uh, you could say, well, no, it's not an emergent because, after all, the meaning of the morpheme, like the word past, is exactly and nothing more than the meaning of its components in their particular relationships. Uh, or you could say, well, languages have these, these morphemes, they're kind of prepackaged units which don't let those components disperse. They package those units in a particular way. So maybe they, form, maybe they do form a kind of um, packeted uh, gestalt form of, of concepts. Uh, and so maybe they should be taken as a kind of uh, higher level, separate enti new, new, new level entity. I don't know. Anyway, that gets you through the six or eight, depending on how you count, kind of uh, uh, ways in which language is, uh, is uh, discrete, uh, is digital. Um, so the upshot of all this is digitalness in languages is extensive. Um, furthermore, it has several different possibly as many as eight distinct kinds of digitalness, and given that there are different kinds of forms of arrangement and constraints on these arrangements, I mean, each of which could have perhaps evolved at a separately at separate times and on different bases. And hi it's hierarchically structured, so there's, uh, it, within digitalness itself, I've got four different components that make that up. And, and within the formal characteristics of digitalness, there's, there's, there's one sort of feeds into the next. <coughs> Discreteness feeds into um, um, categoriality, which feeds into recombinance, which feeds into emergentness. So, so there's hierarchical in character. It's all very complicated. Okay. okay, I think what I should next do is just skip to the part where I, I show how um, this digitalness that we've now established in language may have overcome the bottleneck. Uh, I'm going to try and show how some of these, these digital things compensated for the, the bottle part of the bottleneck. So um, we had a noisy medium. Uh, it's a noisy medium between people. How do you compensate for, for that? Because the medium for, I'm presuming that, in the manual audio, visual channel, it's a much cleaner medium unless there's a fog or something, it's easier to, our visual system is such that it can dis, dis, discern much more finely dis differentiated kinds of things. Where this is, whereas the vocal auditory channel is in the medium of sound, which can be, and, and at a distance, can be rather noisy and rather poor is poor. Um, how do you overcome that? And it seems like digitalness has done that in several ways. Um, First, it does it by um, making sure that, it, well, by, well, first of all, by discreteness itself, so that you know that you've got one or another identity of unit, instead of having to locate, discern some degree of gradients, and, and where things hinge on whether or not you've got the right degree of gradients, instead, um, you, you just have to have enough to identify, am I in this unit or am I in that unit? So discreteness helps. It also helps um, to have a relatively small inventory, a known inventory, pre-known, which is agreed on between the sender and the receiver, so that you know that uh, the units are only going to be of a certain, certain set 
number and nothing outside it. So all that helps you overcome uh, the low fidelity. Okay, so um, uh, the, the, one of the other things was uh, the, the fact that spoken language had was low in parallelness. It had very few parallel parameters going on at the same time, um, which meant that uh, somebody playing a video game. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, which meant that, uh, as c contrasted with a sign language, relatively less information could be uh, uh, conveyed over the over because you've got fewer channels to, to convey it over. Lower, lower bandwidth, what's the way to compensate for that? Well, um, because that'll slow you down. Well, you get, you compensate for it by having greater speed, and, um, and you get greater speed by having digitalness, because um, if you can identify units quicker, I mean, more, more accurately, you can, you, can, uh, can, you can introduce them into the channel at a quicker rate. So you have uh, greater, s your loss of speed over low bandwidth is compensated for by uh, a greater distinctness of the digital character. I mean, the same is true in electronic formats today. I mean, it's just the same logic, I think, oh, which evolution overcame. Let's see what time it is. Oh, we're getting late. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip this whole, the rest of this. I mean, there will be, you get the idea of what I mean by compensations. And very quickly, just uh, go to section nine uh, in part four, I guess. And I'll just, uh, since we're, it's pretty late, I'll just give kind of like a taste of what I have in mind for this. The issue is, um, as I stated before, so the issue is, uh, by the way, this, an earlier version of this is written. This, this handout represents my latest thinking, which is more advanced than the written version. But the written version, oh, again, I, sh I promise to mention it every talk. Um, everything I've written is on my website, uh, including this new paper that I'm just talking about. It's, it's on my website. What is it called? Uh, well, uh, it's called uh, Recompetence in the Evolution of Language. So anyway. Um, the, the idea is that um, uh, do other, other cognitive systems have anything like this, this kind of digitalness? And if set two steps of digitalness, namely discreteness and categoriality, I think do exist in other, uh, other cognitive systems with some, some extent of ex extensiveness. So for example, within visual perception, um, the, the mere fact that you can identify an object, you know, a bottle, just look at it and say, and know that it's a bottle, well, it's visual, or, or you know, a rock, whatever. Um, that's identities of objects are discrete kinds of things. They're not continuous. So that's an aspect of discreteness and categoriality in vision. Maybe you have them in motor control. Maybe there are discrete m motions, like uh, uh, bending at the waist or bending at the knee, which could be considered a discrete motor element. Uh, it may, it may, maybe some part of your cognition treats it that way. I, I don't know. If so, then we've got something similar there. Um, the fact that you're, maybe, uh, yeah, hue in, within vision, hue, namely color, I mean like red, green, yellow, is discrete in a way that brightness and saturation are not. Usually color is defined in terms of hue, brightness, saturation. Well, brightness is a gradient, brighter or fainter. Saturation is a gradient. Uh, hue is not. So the way our, ha our cognition treats color perception, it treats one of them, two of, the, two of the aspects as a gradient, as an analog kind of thing. One of them it treats as a discrete categorical kind of thing. Um, uh, OK, so we've got this an affect, the affect system. Uh, Probably or perhaps um, animals and 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 certainly humans, I would suppose, but perhaps chimpanzees could experience, insofar as they're conscious of them, a metaconscious of them, um, that um, anger is a different, distinct, categorically distinct emotion from affection. 
so there could be categoriality. It's not just one gradient affect affective system. Like Hue, there may be dis experience discrete uh, kinds of emotion. Okay, so that exists. Uh, and language would have had no problem uh, copying that, borrowing that, uh, tapping into that, whatever, however it, it could have established that relation. Um, but you're hard, it's, it's less clear and you're harder put to, um, to identify forms of recomb recombination and emergentness in, in other cognitive uh, systems. There are potential candidates, for example, um, there is a theory of geons uh, by a particular perception psychologist which believes that, who believes that there are uh, distinct uh, categories of basic fundamental visual forms. The thing is, he is, what's his name again? He was, um, I know he was influenced by language in his theory, uh, so he may have, you know, maybe going backwards, but anyway, uh, he, uh, the, the notion that there are uh, different geons, uh, like cylindrical shapes, flat shapes, uh, loops, whatever, and they and objects. The the full shape of objects can be um, characterized as, you know, for example, cylinders attached to another cylinder with a, uh, a sphere attached to the cylinder. So something seen in that way. If so, fine. Maybe we've got uh, with the result as an emergent kind of thing, human form. Fine. Then maybe there's some kind of recombinance there. Um, so maybe that's an example. Maybe you have examples in motor control. So maybe uh, bending at the waist and bending at the knee com combined together gives you a gestalt emergent pattern, a notion of sitting, as a sitting uh, uh, motor, motor pattern. Uh, so uh, maybe we have uh, examples in, uh, all sorts of examples maybe with um, uh, pre-hominid examples, like for example, you see mating rituals in various animals like stickleback fish. I mean, you uh, uh, the female does one kind of motion, the male does another, and the female does a different one. And um, and if if you're the right species, then you know you you go through a succession of uh, of patterns, which uh, then say, okay, it's okay to mate or something like that. So. Uh, so maybe that's an example of uh, a gestalt, uh, of, a, of an emergent, higher level thing made up of components. Um, the thing though is you, it's kinda, it gets kind of hard to find definitive cases of it, and, and uh, whereas the, uh, the language ones are so clear and, and so uh, definitive and so pervasive, that again, we don't know. I mean, it, it, much more research will be needed at this particular interface to see if um, uh, language uh, uh, in, uh, evolved it afresh or borrowed it and elaborated it all to hell. We don't know. Uh, and then the last thing, which we won't have, I'll end here, but the last thing that we won't, we'll have time for is uh, whether or not thought co-evolved with language so that our aspects of our thought are now much more digital than they were before. Um, so this is the tenth lecture, the last one out of ten. I, I thought I'd uh, just say that I, I feel like um, I'm one of the early entrants in the Olympics, and in particular the decathlon, which is, you know, ten events, and, uh, and, uh, and it's um, maybe uh, I'm a harbinger of further Olympics to come. But, okay, thanks.